Welcome to this webinar on the launch of iGaming in the Netherlands. With the market opening on the 1st of October, it's more important than ever for this panel of experts to analyze how a sustainable operating model can be formed and sustained. This webinar is sponsored by Every Matrix and will be recorded and made available on demand. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them via the GoToWebinar interface. With that, I'd like to hand over to our moderator for the session, Birgitta Sand, CEO of Birgitta Sand and Associates. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this uh, session about the Dutch uh, iGaming market. Um, my name, as was just said, is Birgitta Sand. Uh, I used to be uh, heading the Danish Gambling Authority for 12 years, and since last year, I'm now working as an advisor to governments, uh, authorities, and indeed also industry uh, regarding gambling. So I have the great pleasure to invite you to listen in on uh, this uh, very uh, experienced uh, panel. And we have four panelists here. We have an hour in front of us. And uh, we will cover, uh, to us, we believe, some very interesting questions that we would like to discuss and hopefully give you some insight on what's happening in, in the Netherlands. Uh, but obviously, if you have some other questions that you find extremely interesting as well, uh, please do share them with us, and I'll do my utmost to provide you with some answers from the panelists in due time. Uh, so really, depending on uh, how we're getting on with the prepared questions uh, to discuss, please be patient, bear over. And, and I will eventually get to your, your questions, hopefully, um, as long as time allows. So stay with us. And uh, I do look forward to moderating some uh, very knowledgeable panelists and charming, I hope. So uh, let's get on, get on with it. Uh, I, I start off with giving the floor to you, David. Please tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and also uh, the market forecast for the Dutch market, please. Thanks, and thanks, Brigitte, and you know, really pleased to be included in this session. Uh, as many of you may know, H2 is a, a lead independent analyst practice, so we're uh, pretty across the numbers in the industry. Our USP is a is a industry forecasting model that's been around since the early 2000s, so we, you know, since the start of online, really, in in, uh, in the industry. Uh, so all the major verticals on and offshore, and forecasting out five years. In terms of the Netherlands, we um, have uh, our figures are used by the KSA at the moment, by the Netherlands Gambling Authority. Uh, they're used in Europe by the EGBA um, and uh, Clarion as well. In terms of our, our partnership with Clarion. And more recently, we've done a report that many of you may see, uh, may have seen with the International Betting Integrity Association on uh, optimum market regulation, which indeed was done in partnership with a number of operators uh, around U Europe, including Peter Paul here um, from the Online Game Gambling Association in the Netherlands. So I'm just going to give you the sort of pre and, and post uh, headlines, if you like, in terms of where we as H2 are seeing the market um you know there are obviously other forecasts but this is kind of how we're um looking at it at the moment so i guess to put it in context you've got to look at the situation with uh, with covid and the effect that that's had on the sector so the drop from 2019 to 2020 was actually been 22 percent um, across the the sector globally that effectively has taken it back to 2010 levels so a, a hell of a hit particularly in the land-based sector, uh, which dropped 29% in, in the year. Um, but the upside to um, the um, pandemic has been the considerable, well, the significant growth um, of online uh, within the industry. So it grew actually 25% uh, year on year um, and uh, is now represents over 21, 20, 21 and a half percent of all global gambling and that's up from 13.5 percent uh, at the start of 2019. Now in terms of the Netherlands it's actually a fairly similar 
um, picture in terms of the, the drop, the, the market in 2019 for total uh, Netherlands gambling, and this is GGR in, in euros, was 3.2 billion. Um, it dropped to 2.4 billion, which is a 24% drop in 2020. Uh, land base dropped from 2.6 to 1.7, um, but online interactive grew from 0.53 billion to 0.613 billion, and that is a that's an increase of 13% um, in online gambling as the market is at the moment, which is obviously predominantly or to a certain extent a large degree of that is offshore. Um, Going forward, um, the actual recovery is is, fair, is looking fairly strong. Um, the, um, the uh, globally, the online recovery has been um, sort of to grow 18% uh, in in this in this year at the moment. Although we're only halfway through it, uh, but we're forecasting a similar level, 17% online growth um, in the in the Netherlands market in 2021. So growing up to 0.72 uh, billion euros by the end of the year. Um, and then the headline really going forward is we have the land-based sector staying fairly fairly flat um, at a 0.5% CAGR through to 2026, so in five years' time. But the interactive market, obviously, because as it regulates, uh, we have growing um, at 16.4% CAGR uh, to reach 1.56 billion by 2026 which in effect is a trebling of where it is now. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that was uh, some very interesting uh, news and, and information. So on that base, I think we carry on with some more uh, questions. Uh, so for you, Peter Paul, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and then obviously also the regulatory process. Uh, it has started and how is it getting on and what the, to be learned from that process for others that haven't perhaps got themselves into this process just yet to apply. So to share a little bit with us on that, please. Thank you, Brigitte, and uh, thank you uh, IGB and every matrix for uh, hosting this, uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Peter Paul de Goei. I'm the Managing Director of the Netherlands Online Gambling Association the trade association for online gambling operators that want to become active as soon as the market opens on the 1st of October um, in a few months from, uh, from today. Um, I myself have a background of more than 20 years in uh, telecommunications, uh, online lottery and online gambling. Um, and uh, the Netherlands Online Gambling Association has been around for quite a while, uh, albeit under a different name. Uh, it was set up in 2013 as the foundation Play Responsibly of Stichting Spiel Verantwoord, as it is called in Dutch. And we um, rebranded uh, last year, August, into the Netherlands Online Gambling Association. Um, and like you said, um, a, a few of the, the, the members of NOGA have already put in their application uh, with the KSA. Uh, as we all know, uh, from April 1st uh, this year on, it was possible to apply for a license. And the idea that the KSA had was to have a, a staged opening of the market. So basically um, a big bang uh, in the period from April 1st to April 15th. And all applicants that have put in their application in that period uh, can expect, if all goes well, to uh, to get their license uh, per the 1st of October 2021. Um, the KSA has indicated uh, a few months ago that they had received 28 license applications so far. Uh, I, I think by today it will probably be uh, slightly higher and I expect it to grow considerably over the coming months. Um, and what we uh, in NOGA are doing to uh, ensure that everybody can learn from experience uh, from, let's say, the, the, the brave Marines, the ones that are going in first, um, we exchange the, um, uh, the experience that uh, applicants have with the KSA uh, on a technical uh, level, that is. So we in, in NOGA, uh, which is open for a session, I might say, so anyone who wants to become a member can become a member in principle. 
we have a technical working group every month and in this technical working group the um, the applicants basically exchange technical information on the application with the uh, with the other members that still have to go through the application procedure so this is a way in which we try to learn from uh, the experience in the Netherlands which is fairly limited at this stage but also in the technical working group of course we exchange the information that is learned from other markets which have a long track record, uh, uh, for instance, like uh, Denmark, which is very known to you, uh, Vigita, uh, but also from uh, markets that have been um, opened more recently, like uh, Sweden. So th that is a way in which we try to learn from, well, learn from experience, but also learn from mistakes, not try and make the, the same mistakes twice. Um, so hopefully uh, this will lead to a, a qualitative uh, and a quantitative uh, quantitatively successful opening in the in the near future, uh, Birgitta. Thank you so much, Peter, Paul, and perhaps uh, Alan. Mm -hmm. I could ask you more or less the same question about the process. So some applicants, as we just learned, have already entered into the process of uh, getting a license and others are just still sort of like uh, getting into uh, the different requirements and so forth. So uh, please introduce yourself, Alan, in more detail and uh, uh, and give us some answers um, on the same question, please. Sure. So I'm Alan Littler working at uh, Health Cats in France and I started actually a decade ago uh, this year uh, working in the industry, having done a PhD in Tilburg on, on gambling and European law. Um, and even a decade ago, the plans, you know, were on, well, they weren't set out, set out on paper, but it was clear that something was over the horizon. So a decade later, we're now actually finally working on those license applications. Um, and perhaps that has some advantages, you know, the, the regulator or the legislator can have a look at other jurisdictions. Um, as you know very well, they look very closely at uh, the Danish model, the approach in Denmark. But it also has its disadvantages because the longer it festers without you know, any real movement, um, the more other people, other stakeholders, they claim and try and influence the process and influence the regulations, um, influence the enforcement approach, those currently on the market without a local license. Uh, and so you realize, I think, the longer it takes, the more complicated it perhaps can be on a few fronts. But anyway, the 1st of April came. Um, Gambling Authority opened the license application portal on that day, and indeed those who could apply before the 15th of a um, before the 15th of April had the opportunity, um, or will have the opportunity, let's hope, of going live in October on uh, hopefully October 1st. Um, those who applied in April had a few a few advantages, I should say, and perhaps disadvantages, but we'll figure those out as we go along. Um, but they were able to basically apply without having had their game system tested and certified. So perhaps as a point of departure from other jurisdictions, um, the KSA has required that the testing is done prior to application. So all those who are applying after the 15th of April, um, as of this summer into the autumn, they will basically have to have their system fully certified before they actually submit their application. Um, and what we've seen, I should say at the moment that perhaps we've had seen less substantive feedback than we had imagined on the individual policies that applicants have submitted so far. Um, but that doesn't mean to say we're not learning and that we're not learning by doing. Um, as, as some of you will have seen, the Gambling Authority has published a number of Q&As on its website. Um, we have fielded many questions to the Gambling Authority over the past few months and are grateful for their responses. Uh, some responses were more helpful than others, uh, I have to say. Um, and not all the, all the Q&As are publicly available on their website, but it's very clear that the authority is also learning. So I think for those who are planning on applying in the coming months or six months' time, I think it's necessary to realise the answers aren't there yet. Um, and I think a lot of the answers won't be there for you know quite a few months to come. Um, so the Gambling Authority will be looking, of course, at the applicant's reliability, and that's one of the key points, um, and compliance with the cutting off criteria. And what we have seen and what has been confirmed is don't try and fool the authority and apply early. Really wait for those 33 months that have passed. Um, otherwise, 
uh, you know, the chances of getting or successfully applying are dramatically reduced. Um, but that's one side. In terms of the technical requirements, in terms of compliance uh, with policy requirements, etc., we haven't seen so much feedback as perhaps we'd imagined so far in relation to those applications with which we've been involved. So either they're perfect or the critique is still to come. I suspect the latter. Um, but also what we've seen are an awful, lot, an awful lot of questions relating to how should this be interpreted, how should that be interpreted. Um, and that's, of course, important for those who are developing the software, the platforms, uh, the control database software, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps there isn't that degree of um, well, de degree of knowledge that we would have liked to have had by now. So I can imagine that those who are applying now, you know, please be please be realistic and also appreciate that not everything has perhaps been crystallised. And I would imagine that a lot will be crystallised. It will become more certain, um, yeah, as of as as we move forwards. Um, but we've definitely Great. been learning, but we're not there. <laughs> we're not there yet. Thank you, Ellen. That was very uh, interesting indeed. And now I hope to learn even more interesting stuff from you, Kiro. Uh, so please do share with us uh, some uh, details on for about yourself, but also uh, take us to one of the very obviously interesting elements of the new uh, regulation. I'm thinking of the self-regulation, uh, self-exclusion system, not self-regulation, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but self-exclusion system, crooks, as it's called, the nickname. Uh, so what is this uh, system all about? And, and how would you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, suppliers' uh, capability of supporting operators in getting it right? Uh, because it's complicated stuff, right? So uh, uh, please share with us, what can you offer as a supplier to our industry? Thank you, Birgitta, first of all. Uh, as introduced, my name is Kirill. Uh, I come from a company called Every Matrix. We are a B2B uh, supplier for the iGaming industry. And uh, the reason uh, for my uh, joinment here is, is uh, not only that we have decided to support uh, the initiatives uh, related to the uh, Netherlands, but also because we got a little bit more interested in the market and, and actually have published uh, a gaming market report uh, in May of this year, our interest started uh, a couple of years back when we kind of understood that the market will be uh, re-regulating itself and that uh, it is a, a potential uh, to basically allow the operators to use our system, which in a way uh, offer a turnkey solution for the market, but at the same time, uh, what we do offer is also a, a modular approach, a Lego-like, uh, if you uh, feel that's close to your heart, we get the approach to <laughs> offering the products in um, in any market, actually, and 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 the the question around uh, crooks is a is a very interesting one. Although the name itself is a, a little bit misleading, uh, it is a it is basically a centralized uh, player registration database, uh, and it's based on the social security uh, numbers, uh, uh, much like it is uh, currently in Denmark. And as my colleagues uh, on the panel here mentioned, uh, we're looking into uh, seeing the best practices in other countries and, and trying to learn from that as a B2B supplier. Uh, but the, the key point is that uh, accommodating country legal aspects should be of utmost importance for suppliers and even the accountability uh, falls on the operator uh, side given the new regulation in the Netherlands. And, and there are six steps to crooks uh, and, and uh, I won't go into the detail, but uh, essentially players who are registered as self-excluded in crooks must be, uh, so to speak, rejected uh, by operators. And though this is not a, a current step in connecting uh, to crooks, the gaming authority uh, uh, recommends combining the self-exclusion checks with age checks, which uh, will uh, most likely become mandatory as well. Now, how we support as every matrix uh, our partners is by enforcing all the responsible gaming requirements 
uh, and, and we have already integrated a specific module in our core platform called uh, Game Matrix, uh, which uh, allows, and as you said, uh, following the uh, several nation self-exclusion systems uh, in, in, into its player account management system, like uh, the UK, Denmark, Lithuania, uh, and Sweden, um, we are we're looking into uh, basically allowing the operators to uh, have a seamless flow uh, in terms of their integration and onboarding on the specific market. Now, on the gaming vendor side, which is an interesting topic uh, in itself, uh, every matrix has the capacity to implement several uh, player protection features without any extra development work. So trying to uh, see ourselves as uh, helping the uh, operators in, in the markets that they want to go in, be it the reality checks, time limit, uh, uh, specific authenticity checks, etc. So our operators will have 100% control uh, over their responsible gaming, which is essential given that the new Dutch uh, uh, regulations have stipulated uh, and placed it on the B2C side. Now, a just a final note, apart from handling the integration uh, with Crooks, uh, uh, suppliers uh, should also help clients respect regulations on marketing and promotions, uh, which is another key area that I believe uh, we should touch upon. Uh, and, and, and how we're doing this is by providing an agile bonusing tool that can easily be customized to be compliant and do all of the necessary KYC and, and uh, age verification checks with high accuracy. Um, so with that, I would I would stop uh, on 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 that note and uh, yeah, allow anyone to to comment. But uh, thank you for the invite. I should have said that probably in the very beginning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in uh, uh, in a company of such esteemed uh, panelists. Thank you very much, Thiru, and uh, thank you for your insights and explanations and so forth. And then I think we'll turn back to you, David. And uh, you're the popular one on the panel. You have already received the question, right? And uh, so before asking you to explain us a little bit about channeling rates, this is always an extremely interesting question, I think, to all uh, stakeholders in any gambling market. Uh, perhaps, would you spend just a minute perhaps uh, considering the question? Would that be okay? Have you had time to study it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I was going to say at the top, actually, if, if anybody wants to contact uh, me direct, you know, afterwards in terms of the numbers for clarification, it's david.henwood at h2gc.com. Fairly simple. You can find us uh, on the website, on the H2 website. But in terms of the growth of, of the market, um, it, it is uh, a fairly steady growth um, that we're forecasting. Um, and that's probably with, and it's probably worth saying at the top as well that we are we do tend to uh we're fairly conservative in our forecasting as, as a company so we do um tend to be a little bit more realistic perhaps than a little bit more um uh overestimating the market shall we say um but in in the netherlands it's a fairly steady growth um probably down to um the regulation the way the regulations are framed at the moment in terms of suppressing some of the activity that, that there will be onshore. Um, that said, the online betting channel will grow considerably faster initially, in our view, than the, the online casino channel. Um, the online casino is, is, is currently bigger, um, but by 2022, we, we're forecasting uh, the betting market to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to overtake online casino. And that's, that's predominantly because of the, the World Cup, but also um, it's symptomatic of um, betting's growth anyway, and the extent to which it is now, well, it is 50, 51% of all online gambling all, all over the world. So you tend to find in the online market, uh, the betting product um, dominates. Um, in terms of the report that's suggested in the question, uh, an H2 Netherlands report, I have, I'd obviously have to see that, So, but you know, happy to take that. Um, afterwards, but in effect, yeah, betting overtaking casino in in 2022, but then casino growing as well, and and both being fairly, uh, fairly uh, sort of uh, equal bedfellows, should we say, by 2026. I think betting with 42% of the market and casino with about 38, 39% of the market. 
So uh, great, David. Thank you for, for that. And uh, so would you get back to sharing a little bit about channeling rate with us? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I think the context here is where the Netherlands is at the moment um, in terms of its market size and the activity that's happening um, offshore. Um, if you look at the EU 27 plus UK, as we now have to re reference them, um, Netherlands is currently the 14th biggest in terms of, of market size in, in 2020. Um, but it, and in terms of its percentage online, it's the 24th. So this is where the headroom for, for growth is, uh, is predicted. But if we look at the channeling rate, um, as we are um, forecasting or as we are tracking it, um, at the moment, it is by far the lowest um, channeling rate in, in, uh, across those 28 countries. Its channeling rate is 15.5%. Uh, that's the percentage of online activity that is onshore. And that's obviously due to the nature of the market, its monopoly structure at the moment, and the fact that there is little uh, in terms of an online offer. Um, in terms of the growth going forward, um, this year um, growing to 26% by the end of 2021, um, and then a rapid rise, of, rise as we say, in 2022, we've got it going up to 67% by the end of 2022, and then uh, a step change again to 2026, up to 81, 82%. Um, we have it at, at the moment under the, under the way the current regulations are framed. Now, now that would put it on an equal footing uh, with countries such as France, Poland, uh, Greece, uh, and Belgium in terms of the channeling rate, a channeling rate in that sort of low 80% um, rate. Um, the, the lower markets um, are uh, countries like Germany, although it, it is regulating as well. Um, we're predicting it to be lower come 2026 at 69, 70%. Um, but, you know, in terms of the ones that are performing well, in terms of uh, channeling offshore activity onshore, you, you've got to look at the Spains, the Swedens, uh, the Italys, Czech Republic, UK, and of course, Denmark. Uh, so, uh, Ooh, you've got me sweating uh, yeah. there. The 90% plus is where you want to kind of be, in our opinion, in terms of optimum market regulation. So, um, growing quite quickly, but falling a little bit short in, in by 2026. Thank you so much, David. Do you just, just curious, obviously, everybody wants to get up in the 90s, uh, at least in this sense. Uh, mm. So, uh, do you expect uh, Holland to get up there as well? Do you expect who? Sorry. Do you expect uh, the Dutch market also to be channeling like up to 3 percent eventually? Not, not at the moment. Not to. Um, we are. We're only forecasting to 2026 at the moment. Right. And 2026, we have a 81.8 percent. Right. Thank you so much, David. We got so much wiser. By this so thank you very much for your insight and then turning to uh, to you Peter Paul again so uh, a slight different uh, subject but still one of the very important ones and it has been talked about a lot the cooling down period the whole idea about having a cooling down period um, so really um, what was the rationale what was the idea about having a period like, like that please yeah, so um, it's it's a really important uh, topic. Also, uh, in terms of when we are when we will be able to reach the uh, channelization uh, target of eighty percent that the government has uh, set for itself, uh, I think by twenty twenty four. So after three years of being enacted, uh, we have to be at eighty percent. Now, um, the the cooling off period. Um, the way I see it, I have to say that, you know, is it because I can't look into the heads of the politicians that came up with it. But initially, it was a period of 24 months um, of uh, cooling off, literally, uh, for operators that have been violating the prioritization criteria. Um, the Netherlands has had a system of prioritization criteria, which basically says that you shall not um, actively 
um, target Dutch consumers. Uh, and if you do so uh, by, for instance, having a Dutch uh, language website or a, a .nl uh, URL, or by using a Dutch, a typical Dutch payment provider, um, you you violate the prioritization criteria and um, uh, the, the politicians thought that it was a good idea to give a little bit more meaning to um, uh, the, the fact that there were violations of the prioritization criteria. And then they came up with the idea to basically punish uh, the operators that had violated these uh, prioritization criteria and to make them wait for a while to cool off, uh, basically to become squeaky clean before they could apply for a license. Because if you want to apply successfully for a license, you need to be able to prove to the regulator that you are uh, of uh, a very good background, as they would say. So, you know, the background checks will have to be uh, all uh, ticked, the green tick boxes. Um, and uh, the reasoning was if you've been basically actively targeting Dutch consumers uh, in a period of 24 months before your application, uh, then you cannot be considered to be squeaky clean, you cannot be considered to be of uh, good reputation. Um, now, since then, this was 2019, this February 2019 was the motion postuma in the um, in the Senate. Uh, they have well, there were there were some delays uh, with the act coming into force, uh, and as a result, we are now from uh, the original 24 months uh, to 33 months. And the way it works is that you will have to uh, have. Uh, stayed away from the prioritization criteria for at least a period of 33 months prior to the application date. So you basically have to work your way back 33 months. Uh, and that's why it's so important what Alan said, um, to check whether you have been squeaky clean from a certain period so that you're, you're not putting in your application too soon. Because if you put in your application too soon, it might be turned down. And then you have a turned down application on your uh, uh, state, uh, which is going to be problematic uh, with with the next uh, application. So it's very important. Um, yeah, um, that's that's basically it, uh, Brigitte. Thank you very much, Peter Paul. So just an additional question for you. Um, do you know how many uh, operators that are still sort of like left a little bit behind or still just waiting to be able to actually uh, um, mm. ask for a license so um, like everybody else number but is there a lot out there still waiting yeah like everybody else I have to work from guesstimates you know from yeah. what's yeah. what is publicly available in the in the news and in, in magazines and online uh, websites and, and stuff um, like public information um, some of the larger operators are still cooling off uh, and I do expect these operators to uh, you know file their application over the period of the coming months uh, until basically the end of March next year and I, I think uh, but maybe Alan can say a few words about this but I think that that is when the window uh, will close that is when you know whether or not you've been cooling off or not, or you know whether or not you have been abiding by uh, the prioritization criteria is no longer important, uh, then uh, the, uh, the KSA will have a very strict view of uh, who can apply for a license and who not. Uh, but you know, in terms of, yes. to, put a, to put a number to it, um, I, I would, out of the larger operators that will become active on the Dutch market, some of them, some of them are my members. Uh, I, I do expect them, you know, uh, a, a number of six or seven to be, you know, to be filing their application over the coming months. But it's it's very vague because I, I simply don't know. No, but that's uh, that's good enough, I would say. Thank you very much, Peter Paul. And now turn to you, uh, Alan, again, please. So slightly a different uh, question for you, unless you want to just literally a uh, comment a little bit on Peter Paul and then turn to uh, another question about uh, really um, uh, how can can um, the new regime uh, perhaps impact on the B2B suppliers uh -huh. because they're not, not directly uh, part of an application process right but they do obviously support uh, yes. the operators so Alan please have a have a choice 
do both questions, please, if you can. And I'll certainly do both questions because I'm itching to respond to a few things which Peter Paul said. Yep. Um, so yes, the window closes on the 31st of March 2022. So if you're an operator who has to cool off, then your application has to be in before by the 31st of March or on the 31st of March at the very latest. Otherwise, the gambling authority will revert to a much stricter interpretation of the law, whereby an unlawful presence, whether targeted or not, will uh, basically count against you. But I think there's quite a bit of critique, perhaps generally, um, about the cooling off criteria. But let's remember that it could have been worse, because before the Postema motion, there was the Baumeister motion, and that basically said that basically called upon the government to um, not award licenses or ensure that licenses aren't awarded to those operators who have been on the market I and mean, it didn't talk about targeting or not so yes it is a pain in the you know what to calculate when uh, you can apply and make sure that you haven't done anything that will trip you up um but at the same time i think if it wasn't for the motion postma the postma motion it could have been much more difficult for some of the larger and uh, for the larger and also smaller names to enter the market so um yeah i would imagine that there'll be many applications going in, in the direction of the hague as of october um up until up until march up until and including march um and i'd also be interested to see whether we hit the 80 percent or the 82 percent rate uh, by was it 2026 because the government's own objective of 80 percent was set on the, was formed on the basis of the tax rate tax rate being 20 percent gdr and it's 29% EGR with an additional 1. Point, uh, I think it's 75 or 1.95 on top. So I think you know, yeah, the uh, the regulatory regime is perhaps good in some senses. There are no limits on um, player behaviour or returns to player or that type of thing, as perhaps other jurisdictions. But at the same time, with the tax, with the regulatory burden, it's not a walk in the park. Um, which then brings me round to the B to B parts. Um, I suppose you could say one of the ways of achieving channelization is if the gambling authority is strict on enforcement. Um, and as of the 1st of April this year, those who facilitate unlicensed offers are also in breach of the law. Before the 1st of April, it was very questionable. Now, it isn't. I would say the vast majority of uh, B2B suppliers probably don't have much to, be too, much to keep them awake at night until the 1st of April next year, for as long as their operators who are passively available on the market are indeed passively available and are not targeting the market, not targeting the market, are not breaching the cooling off criteria. So I can imagine as of the 1st of April next year, the gambling authority will step, step of its uh, efforts in this regard. Um, it has a new enforcement measure available. It can issue a binding instruction on a, towards a party to start doing something. Uh, without there necessarily being a penalty attached to that. Um, the legislative texts, which have been sitting on the shelves for many years, refer to the fact that this will be a very effective measure. But they also refer to the fact that the authority will um, take enforcement measures against the operators first. But as we know from practice, that can take a good while before it filters through to an actual sanction decision. Um, so I wonder, I question whether the authority will always go after the operator first or whether it will go for a PSP or a software supplier or whoever else in the first instance. But that will become clearer um, as of 2022. At the same time, um, there are quite a few requirements in terms of outsourcing. So as we noted earlier, as was noted, everything falls on the shoulders of the, uh, the B2C operator, the license applicant, the license holder. Um, but they will also have to get their house in order in terms of uh, the contracts that they have with the B2B suppliers. So there will be the prospect that the gambling authority can ask for a contract with every matrix or whoever, and the authority will expect to see that the, regu that the regulated, the licensed entity, can reach through and say, hey, every matrix, you need to be able to change, you need to change this to comply with local law. And they will also expect that every major every matrix is uh, clients i use you as an example um, but it applies for everybody have done their homework and have ensured that their suppliers are compliant with dutch law so i would imagine again that this won't be a massive problem i hope until the first of april whilst operators are still on the market under the cooling off criteria but if you are a b2b supplier 
um, who's on the market, um, or who, who I should say, is supplying the market after the 1st of April, and you have some operators who are licensed and some operators who are unlicensed, I could imagine that you will have some interesting uh, discussions with, your, with those licensed suppliers. So things will be changing for the P2Ps as well. Thank you so much, Alan. Great insights. Whew. So uh, <laughs> turning to you, uh, Kyo. Uh, so really, uh, this is uh, getting still more interesting, I think, because we do realize, all of us, uh, I believe, that it's not uh, always only about operators, but it's obviously about very much about the choices the operators uh, make in regard to also suppliers, among others. And so tell us a little about your thoughts on the fact that the operators have had to sort of like cool down, uh, let go of their perhaps existing customers in the market and how to get them back or attract uh, new ones. Uh, how do you see that uh, perhaps kind of uh, battle? Uh, how will that look like and how to, what to do about it? Yeah, thank you for uh, for the question. And uh, it's it's. Uh, I just want to go back to what Alan mentioned around the uh, kind of relationship between the B2B suppliers and the B2Cs. It it shouldn't be a one-way street. We we shouldn't be looking at oh uh, we we've washed our hands uh, regarding uh, our responsibility, but rather it should be a partnership um, uh, that we are looking into. And and linking that to the acquisition battle, of course, if you have the right tools, uh, you are in advantage, uh, and that is provided by, by the suppliers. Uh, and of course, losing the possibility of, of leveraging the existing uh, player databases can be daunting for, for most operators, but it can also be viewed from another perspective, which means, you know, Here's an opportunity to start clean, and uh, and it will allow operators, I believe, to market uh, tailored uh, content and and bespoke offering, and and this is what it's all about. It's about the differentiation, um, and we we are sitting on a lot of data ourselves as as a provider, and we know what works. And this is you know on top of what I've mentioned regarding the partnership model. So offering custom co content for the for the Dutch market, uh, fast access to you know a wealth of content of course you know uh, a quantity also matters uh, and 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 also data that can be uh, assess uh, a potential uh, of, of the vendors in the market which will in in turn guarantee that the operator offers uh, a highly attractive product uh, to their players uh, it goes uh, without saying that we should we should also look into uh, branding or uh, I'm not taking the place of the B2Cs, but uh, uh, all the operators that uh, want to enter a market should have uh, branding uh, in, in their forefront. And, and you know, having a, a lot of kind of front-end development options uh, is for sure another uh, essential aspect, which will give the operators an upper hand in the acquisition battle, as you've mentioned, uh, Birgitte, and, and taking the time to build something uh, which is, uh, you know, highly recognizable for a player is not only a requirement, uh, but in my opinion, it, it will actually, uh, it might be a decisive uh, factor in, in a couple of years, whether the operators that have entered the market will stay to play the longer game or uh, leave the space and focus on some other uh, markets. Uh, of course, we... Uh, you know, a fast uh, uh, and, and an agile bonusing system uh, or a module can greatly help operators uh, win market share, uh, also being compliant and, and, and grab a piece of the Dutch, uh, Dutch market. And, and probably the most uh, easier way for operators to thrive in a market is uh, if they launch with, uh, uh, you know, uh, an A to Z solution, which basically covers the, everything from a technical perspective. Um, and, and you can then fully, as an operator, fully focus on acquiring the new players and successfully run uh, your day-to-day your -day operations without having to spend a lot of time uh, in fixing mistakes uh, that could be damaging uh, or, or actually can, can lead to some more serious consequences. Uh, but uh, all the eyes, as we spoke and, and as Alan mentioned, will be on the, on the operators. And there is, I would say, little to no room 
for, for making a mistake and, and we as a provider are here to support uh, large operations in, in regulated market and have done so uh, in, in many years uh, in the past. Uh, so this is kind of where we see ourselves uh, into the mix, helping the operators succeed in the, in the market that they enter. Thank you, Kiro. Good to know that there's someone out there supporting when you need it. So uh, turning to you, Peter Paul, uh, talking a little about, um, you talked about the cooling uh, down period, right? So obviously that does a lot to the competition, right? Um, so what do you believe it has done to competition between those that were already there for perhaps even quite a few years and now had to sort of like cool down, get back in? And of course, those just coming in, uh, absolute newcomers uh, to the Dutch market. What about competition, the competitive landscape? Your thoughts, please. So I, I think the uh, the effects of the cooling off period are uh, it, it, certainly in the beginning. So uh, from the start of October until, let's say, probably October next year will be uh, quite considerable. Um, of course, um, all operators want to be first to market uh, because they want to grab mar market share. Uh, and what is important to mention here is that uh, operators are not allowed to advertise. You know, uh, legally they are not allowed to have any Dutch consumers. Uh, and according to some um, uh, operators that are, um, let's say, passively um, um, uh, servicing uh, Dutch consumers should uh, shut down their uh, their service uh, but th there is there is just a minority of uh, of people uh, i think in the field that are making that case um, but the biggest advantage of uh, being on the market per the first of october is of course that you can advertise and that you can build up your brand and you can build up your presence your online presence without any restrict well with of course the regulatory restrictions but you know, no restrictions on, uh, or no no um, uh, ban on advertising. Uh, so um, it, it will be uh, tough for for uh, operators that are coming onto the market later on to basically bite out uh, to bite a, a share out of that already uh, sustained uh, a market share of uh, of these uh, operators. Uh, so from a competitive point of view, uh, I think it's also hardest to um, to argue that the the cooling off period is really a, a good uh, a good measure, uh, but uh, you know that's crying over spoiled milk. Uh, uh, we have to live with it. That's reality. Um, and I am I'm absolutely convinced that in two years time and in three years time, the effects of the cooling off period will have watered down considerably. And in five years time, nobody will even remember what a cooling off period is. Uh, so, you know, on on so let's say the first year two years the effects will be considerable but then it will dissipate and be completely gone and forgotten in five years time right thank you so much peter paul and now i'm just sharing with all of you that we only have around 10 minutes left so be please a little bit uh, brief about your answers would be nice then we can cover more land still so uh turning to you uh Kyo, um so how do uh, operators uh, avoid sort of attracting or at, at least selling uh, uh, gambling to the wrong people uh, uh, in, in regard to high risk uh, players that really should not uh, be able or have any access uh, to gambling? I mean, how do they make sure they don't get through the cracks in the systems if there are, are any? So, can you support operators in avoiding that? Yes, thank you, Brigitte, for for that question, and it's it's uh, a key one, I would say, uh, so that there isn't any, uh, you know, oversight from the from the regulator from the very get go. Um, but it has been laid out so far that the the KYC process has to follow. 
the Crooks framework very closely. And, and what this means is that once a player is registered and its data is sent to Crooks to verify the status, the operator will receive a, a yes no answer, which indicates if the player is approved or rejected. And although like this, it seems like a, a very simple process. As you said uh, before, the technology behind it is, is not. It doesn't really matter if the operator gets one registration per hour or they get uh, during the, the current peak in, 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 in the Euros 10,000 or more new players coming in. Uh, everything has to be uh, uh, moving flawlessly without an error or any lag. Uh, and, and what we did, and, and I will be very brief, is, is that we've developed a whole module uh, which is called a customer verification. It's a microservice that deals with only this aspect so that the player doesn't have to wait too much to be vetted. And, and what this means is that it is significantly uh, speeds up customer checks, fraud analysis, optimizes KYC accuracies, and also reduces the actual uh, associated costs. And as per the new uh, regulatory requirement, uh, it covers everything from age to documents to proof of address, biometrical, uh, PEP sanctions, AML, uh, and everything in between. So this is what we are uh, trying to do to help, as you said, uh, not have any uh, any any players go uh, fall through the cracks uh, on our side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill. So that was good to know as well. So uh, turning to you, David, we need some more uh, facts from you. So you briefly mentioned a very, I would uh, argue, interesting report that you have recently uh, shared with, with all of us, um, the optimum market uh, regulation. Is there such a thing? <laughs> well, I mean, the report's up on the idea uh, website idea.bet so it is worth having a look at it simply because it's the first of its kind and it's used um, you know actual operator data including all the operators uh, under NOGA um, to you know submit in terms of what is actually happening in terms of channelization so we've got very accurate um, channeling rates um, but it also we've collected quite a bit of information over the last you know 20 odd years and we thought it was worth an idea shared this view the channelization often doesn't, you know, alone doesn't, isn't the sort of real ultimate measure. It's, it's obviously used quite a lot, um, but there are a number of other things that can, um, you know, should be in place in a regulatory framework, in our opinion, that would give you this sort of optimum market approach where um, the government gets, um, you know, its player protection and its tax take and a successful market, if you like. The operators get their, the protection of a license in there operating freedom and the eradication of the offshore but also the the players uh the consumers get you know really good value and good and good choice so um it grades 20 countries at the moment um out of 100 points in terms of their current regulation and you'll see it in the report but the netherlands uh is currently scoring 77 which is you know is is kind of okay it's not bad if you you know if you're trying to sort of you know, grade these things, but there are elements in the regulation at the moment that would are going to suppress the market and keep the offshore. Uh, if you look at it from a sort of economic um, uh, standpoint, um, and the obvious ones are, you know, the tax, the tax take, twenty nine percent. We've actually suggested in the report that the optimum uh, tax level should be in the fifteen to twenty percent um, sort of window, that, that sort of sweet spot. So. Um, clearly, that's suppressed the market. Some of the restrictions on side bets that can be placed. Um, you know, we talked about the advertising restrictions, but also the uh, you know the, the licensing fees and the imposition of a levy as well is going to make. You know, these are fiscal burdens that are going to suppress the market, if you like. But I'll stop there because you know much more of it is in the is in the report. So it's it's worth a look because it's a different way of looking at what makes for a, an optimum market in terms of its regulation. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I, I need to ask you an additional question on this. So I believe what you told us was also there are many ways to roam, right? To get to roam. So mm -hmm. there's more than one way to get it sort of like right. And, and what is right, right? So whatever works for one jurisdiction doesn't necessarily work for another, right? 
but still when we talk about channeling sort of like there comes a time where it goes the wrong way right yeah. so would you argue that the report shows that there are many ways to deal with the issue around channeling and you know uh, but still it takes a certain handful of important elements anyway yeah and you can benchmark across a number of different markets you know particularly as a regulator as you'll know um but you know the bottom line is no two markets are the same and it is all about the you know what the existing offshore market is like at the moment and also the gambling culture within the you know within the yeah. jurisdiction and, and all these things have to be taken in uh you know into effect before you actually get you know good good balance but yeah if if, if one lever's a bit a little bit out it will it will push push potentially you know, particularly high value players offshore at the, at, at the strokes so that's the thing to watch for right thank you so very much david so i believe alan that you will be the last on on the floor here you know but 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 really uh, i will ask you a huge question um, so, so what what should we really look out for for the next couple of years or even three to five years looking at at holland mm -hmm. what do you expect to happen what what will what will happen in the market please what will happen well the first thing that will happen is i'll answer one of the questions which i can see which has been directed to me that's great um, if i may it says, yes when will operators who observe the prioritization criteria be deemed as illegal and should stop their operation in the netherlands um the fact that you're on the market um in the first place is illegal the prioritization criteria determine when the gambling authority will take enforcement action so you could say you should stop today or you should have stopped yesterday. Those criteria have been regurgitated, recycled as the cooling off criteria. So you, if you're on the market under that umbrella, fine, but you have to have your get your application in by the 31st of March next year on the basis that your 33 months of compliance have passed. If not, you will be rejected. If you apply after the 1st of April, you will be rejected so that's something to look at i think for the next three to five years and um, well one of the key important things the key thing i wanted to say is the in the legislative text there was reference to there is reference to a an evaluation of the legislation after three years of entry into force so hopefully april 2024 that process will start of course we don't know how long it will take we don't know how long it will how long it will take before the fruits of that process are implemented but I should imagine that many of the teething problems which we're experiencing now, and there are some, um, and those which are still to emerge will be dealt with by then. I think we'll also see whether the tax is too high. I have a feeling it is, but um, you know how that pans out. And I think we'll also, more in the next year, rather than the next three to five years, have a clearer picture of how the gambling authority is in terms of supervision and enforcement, both towards you know illegal offerings but also towards the, those who have a license and that will also be interesting to see how strict is the gambling authority how you know how much room for maneuver do you have how much room for how, how much room for discussion is there or is it going to be uh, it's this way or it's the highway so it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out and that should start happening sooner rather than later and it's dead on five o'clock so i'm handing it back to you <laughs> thank you so much I mean, I have to, to compliment you. You have been excellent panelists, and thank you for answering uh, uh, my questions uh, and sharing with us your, your years of experience and knowledge. Um, and hopefully uh, all our listeners had a good time as well. And uh, do remember to reach out to, as David mentioned, reach out to David if you want uh, some more insight uh, from uh, H2. And obviously, uh, all of the panels, this uh, can be found anywhere on LinkedIn, I suppose, as well as uh, you can listen in on the recording of this webinar and hear it all once more, even. So, um, Thank you all, and of course, thanks uh, also to um, uh, Clarion for having all of us and uh, IGB. Uh, so it was a great pleasure. Uh, 
uh, to moderate uh, the panel today and see you all. Hope to see you in person soon as well. So uh, good luck, uh, I would say, to Holland uh, <laughs> and uh, to the opening of uh, a hopefully well-regulated uh, uh, legal iGaming market. So thank you so much and have a lovely uh, day wherever you are uh, to our listeners and yourselves, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for listening, to Every Matrix for sponsoring, and to Kirill, David, Peter Paul, and Alan for sharing their insights. Thanks also to Katie for handling the webinar platform. This recording will be available on ice365.com, so you can share the discussion with your colleagues or listen to it again yourself. Our next webinar will be on the importance of retailers in Latin America, sponsored by Playtech. Uh, we look forward to uh, you joining us again then. Thanks. Thank you.